SDL, it's SDL, it's SDL, it's SDL. Despite the weather, it's SDL. So even though it was snowing, uh, I'm here with you. Uh, so we can talk about something out of a plumber's nightmare uh, or something like that. Wolf in the fold part D, uh, the coming storm is continuing our discussions about overflow and buffer overflows and stack overflows and all that kind of stuff that's overflowing everywhere. So stick around and we'll talk about it. This is a Security Weekly production. Welcome to Secure Digital Life. And you type in AAA porn or whatever it is you're typing in. So I'm sorry, we, I was at a PG show. And I'm really yeah. excited to be here. I'm glad you're here because somebody needs to know what's going on. That's right. Okay, so now somebody has to drink this. <laughs> it's another day, it's another episode. Yeah, he's looking at the wrong camera. You, oh. Oh, you moved my, you put my camera over here. Eh, there you go. Basically, forget you ever saw that. I, I think actually forgetting you ever saw that would really be a good idea at this point. It's me, it's Doug, it's back and live from Bang Zoom and whatever that's called, Russ online. There he is, see? Ah, Here yeah. I am. With his multicolored dream coat and all that kind of stuff uh, joining us as well to talk about buffer overflows again. I know you don't want to talk about buffer, but you have to. I mean, if you want to understand Spectre and Meltdown, really, you have to talk about buffer overflows and you have to understand what's going on with that. So that's why we're talking about it. We're building up the big build up to the big letdown of stack overflows in Spectre and Meltdown next week. But today we're going to talk about uh, back to the stack, uh, so to speak. And uh, we want to sort of revisit the discussion I was having last time about stack and heap allocations, just so we can get back and really understand what's going on when we talk about these things. Because this is, I mean, I know it sounds a little boring, but this is the basis of a lot of hacking stuff. Right, Russ? Yeah. Yeah. Buffer, buffer is boring, but it's necessary. So it, It's buffered. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's buffered. Okay, so last time we, when we departed, we were talking about stacks and heaps, and I just want to revisit that a little bit to make sure you understand that that in compiled programs, so when we write code, uh, especially in, 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 and I'm not going to talk about any specific language here because it's going to be nonpartisan programming-wise. I don't want to get into that to that slap fight that people have about which language is better or whatever. But uh, when we talk about stacks and heaps, we're really talking about compiled program uh, language stuff. So uh, the stack in a program is really the core memory allocations that are set when the program is compiled. So part of that compilation process is that you go in and you fix a whole bunch of memory stuff. And that's really important too, because as you fix things in memory, they become locations. And those locations in memory become addresses, and those addresses become known. And that can create problems for you Later, have you ever done memory forensics, Russ? Um, I I have not, but I've heard it being done. Like I've heard other other people doing it. Yeah, and I think I think it's important because, like you said, if you know the location in the memory address uh, in the memory addressing structure, then you could reach kind of retrieve the data that resides in it. No, exactly. So in in for instance C. You can, uh, if you if you set up a variable. So if you if you pick an integer type variable, which is thirty two bits. And yep. that's just the standard C definition of an unsigned integer. So it's, it's any number between uh, zero and like four million and something. I don't remember the exact number, but I used to know it, but it's something like that. You can look it up or I'll, I probably got on, a slot on the show notes. If you set that to some name called X and you say X equals two, what really happens is C creates what's called a pointer. And that pointer is the address of where that two is written in binary in memory. And guess what? In C, you can actually get that address. So you can actually have C print the address of that memory location where that two was stored. So that that's a stack variable that has been set up in that program. Now you may say, well, gee, Doug, I, you know, so what? Well, the truth is, is that if I know that address, other programs, like something you write, could address that same space from outside. 
if you don't take some security precautions. And again, I know we're, I'm oversimplifying it a little bit, but I want you to understand where that's coming from. So if Russ writes a piece of software and at some location, we'll just call it uh, A3, so this is just some arbitrary uh, hexadecimal address in memory. If Russ creates a variable at A3 and he puts, uh, a, for instance, a constant in there. So let's say Russ is writing a program that he wants to have uh, gravity. And he defines a constant, which is uh, 10 meters per second. That's gravity on Earth. And, and it's stored at A3 in memory in the stack. If I write a piece of malware and I know that A3 is where Russ's constant for gravity is, I could literally address that part of memory and change that value. And I could change to 15. And what, what do you think that would do to your drone, Russ? Uh, well, if you change it to 15, that would increase the acceleration due to gravity on the planet, and then it would, it would need to uh, require a lot more lift in order to get it off the ground and keep it up there. Well, at least it would think it required a lot more lift, right? I mean, well, that, that, yeah, that's right. And right. That, that's the problem. This is, uh, this is called a local variable compromise, and you will actually see people do that in a lot of hacking examples where someone has compromised a value that's stored in memory. And that doesn't have to be a constant either. I could actually affect things that are going on in your program with my program. So if, if Russ's drone is flying around and I can somehow corrupt that, I could inject information into Russ's drone's world so that it thinks it's going faster than it actually is or it's going slower than it actually I would probably make it go sl think it was going slower so it would keep accelerating. So then you crash into the Devil's Tower if you've seen that episode. You know, it's just splat. And you're going, what just happened? And those kind of local variable compromises are certainly pieces of buffer overflows that become very critical because this is where you start getting into uh, what are called local and global variables. So local variables in C are, have, have a, a shell around them. That doesn't mean they're safe, but it means they're actually constrained to the program and it's hard for things outside to access them. But if they're global, then anybody can access them that's running at the same time. So if I can inject malware into your software and, and you say, well, this all sounds really esoteric, Doug, but the truth is, is when you start talking about people deconstructing a thermostat code or a drone and they take that open source code and they pull it apart, they can see where these things are done. They can then start writing malware that specifically targets that. When you say, well, gee, they sold 10,000 of these drones, it becomes a real issue, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we, we've seen some compromises with drones, right? Yeah, in fact, the U.S. military has um, all but, well, actually, they even have said that uh, DJI, which is the largest Chinese manufacturer of, of consumer-based drones, um, they're severing or supposedly severing their relationship with them, um, not because they've done anything malicious like, like that, but the potential for that uh, is certainly there. And, and all this stuff came out of like basically what I keep talking about, which, which I call the Leo problem, which is people that designed architecture a long time ago and, that, and the mentality that was used about code and whatever a long time ago sort of tends to just keep rolling forward. And as we find these low-level compromises, they, become, they can become extremely terrible kind of compromises, especially as the world becomes attached. So as everybody yeah. can access everything from remote places, uh, there was a compromise, uh, was it yesterday, about the, the workout software? Did you see that one? And what? No, tell me what workout software. There was a piece of workout software that like tracks where you've been running and all this kind of stuff. And they found out that people were able to map U.S. military bases by by the behavior of people uh, mm -hmm. that were using this software. And they were able. This wasn't necessarily a buffer overflow, but it was the same kind of idea as that somebody's reaching into a piece of software and pulling information out. And that and that's one of the very basic pieces of buffer overflows is being able to reach into a variable allocation and pull that information out or worse, inject your own information into that location. And that can cause very, very strange behavior. Imagine if somebody starts injecting this into your autonomous car and, and mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a buffer overflow kind of situation there. So that's, that's one piece of it. The other piece is called heap. And we talked about this some last time. And I just want to revisit it a little, make sure you understand it. Heap allocations are on the fly. So when a piece of software is running, it isn't always necessarily decided up front exactly what is needed for a specific piece of software. So heap allocations, or as the program is executing uh, in C, these are, these are called alloc and malloc kind of commands. 
and people are actually creating variables and blocking or hooking space in memory as the program runs. And that leads you to a second kind of buffer overflow. So the second kind of buffer overflow then is if I create a variable like say y, so now I create another integer variable, so it's 32 bits, and I create it, and I just hooked out 32 bits of memory, and that doesn't sound like very much. But what if I put that in an endless loop? So now I put a piece of software in there, and it, and it just keeps allocating y. It just, another one, another one, another one, another one, another one. And this is the wolf in the fold thing. So th this is back to, to Spock and the wolf in the fold that we talked about last time. If those Ys keep getting allocated, so every time I do it, I add 32 bits, 32 bits, 32 bits, 32 bits, 32 bits, 32 bits. And, and you know, I can do that really, really fast. Very quickly, what happens is all of the memory gets allocated. And this, this essentially will cause a, a, a stack overflow, which will crash your, your piece of software, maybe. You don't know what it's going to do. And that, that was what a lot of early hackers were, were actually doing, was just little malicious things like that. And, and last time I talked a little bit about the ping of death, which was another kind of buffer overflow I'm going to get to in a minute. But all these things are just filling up memory. And I think the first buffer overflow I ever wrote, uh, I was just fooling around and I, I wrote something in C to essentially allocate bits until we ran out just to see what would happen. And one of the things that people would, you may have heard people call uh, crash to the shell. So if you can crash a piece of software and get a root shell, this was an early, you know, hack kind of model, the root shell meant your software crashed. Have you, have you ever had anything mm -hmm. crash, Ross? You had a piece of software crash? Yeah, I mean, yeah mostly with the DDoS uh, stuff, which is kind of similar where if you allocate all that, um, if you allocate enough, uh, information to or send enough information to a machine, the machine can reboot. And then, you know, that's what hackers are looking for is the process of, of recycling power to a machine so that potentially what could happen is you could get somehow administrative control over that machine um, if it reboots. A absolutely. And and the thing about, I think, to remember about both stack and heap type crashes is is it's the unknown behavior that, that hackers were looking for. Sometimes it just crashes. So if you get a blue screen of death, Oh, well, that didn't accomplish very much for the hacker. It might be annoying to somebody. So if you can make somebody's desktop crash over and over and over again, okay. But other types mm -hmm. of crashes don't necessarily get blue screens of death. They may get reboots. And here, here's sort of a scenario for you in that kind of buffer overflow situation. Let's just say for a second that I could crash Russ's drone. And when Russ's drone is booting up, in that boot up process, because of the way it was designed, there may be a time during that boot up when I could access certain system functions that I couldn't access when it's running fully because they didn't load the security until last. So you load the operating like system. CMOS. It's what? Like CMOS. Like CMOS or, bio, or getting into the BIOS. Yeah, or even the, even the actual operating system. If it's loaded and they haven't embedded, say, their firewalling or their port blocking, but they start the network stack, the network may be available to me for a very brief period of time. And, and you say, oh, come on, Doug, who's that fast? And the answer is, well, you're not, but your software is. So if I can write code that goes out and does these, I put a piece of malware on drones and I know that I can reboot them at certain times. I can sit in an office building and watch for an Amazon drone to fly by, cause that reboot, and the drone goes into some kind of idle state and just hovers there while it's booting up. I can then inject more malware into the system that may, I don't know what, it may, it may extract information, it could extract the delivery destination, it could change all those things, but all that stuff can go on. And that's essentially why people started writing these kind of overflows. Um, there used to be a, a, an old piece of malware that was called uh, Autumn or something like that, and it, it made all these leaves fall down your screen. And so you'd be working and you'd see like a leaf form on the top of the screen and it would just fall to the bottom of the screen. And what happened was the leaves kept piling up. And what they were doing was slowly filling up memory with these leaves. And when the leaves got about three quarters of the screen, usually the system would crash. And this was just annoying. But, it, but if you can inject those kind of buffer overflows, all of a sudden, wow, you, you've actually accomplished something. And, and those are very easy to code in a lot of languages. And, and you'll see people doing that. Another then kind of buffer overflow is where we start getting into this sort of getting out of bounds kind of thing. And the ping of death, which I talked about last time, but I'll bring up again, the ping of death was injecting a number bigger than a field that it could hold. So mm -hmm. what they did was they, they stuck a number bigger 
than the maximum size of the field in a ping instruction. And if you didn't know on a ping, you can actually set the size of the data payload. Just type ping minus H sometime or whatever operating system you're using, and you'll see all the different switches you can set. And they put a bigger number in there than was allowed. And when they did that, it caused the whole internet to crash, literally. I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. It was brought the internet to a screeching halt back in like 2000. And it was crazy. Uh, if in a 32-bit variable, I did put the number in the show notes, 4,294,967,295 is the biggest number in an unsigned int. And if you put which in... Is by the, sorry, which is, by the way, Doug, the reason why 32-bit windows can only hold 4 gigs, theoretically, of RAM. That's exactly why, because when they designed that architecture, that's what they set it to. They allowed 32-bit buffers. If you buffer overflow that, guess what? I don't know what happens. You may get a blue screen of death. It might crash. It might drop into a DOS shell or who knows what. <laughs> and those are always the things that hackers are looking for with buffer overflows. And, and, and on a drone, if you could cause it to crash to a root shell and then you could manipulate or take it over remotely, that would be a pretty intense kind of thing to get involved in, right? Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, even if you, it, it's actually a physically de physical device, which weighs, you know, a few pounds. So even if you had them crash at four say 500, 600 feet, they're going to cause some damage. So, you know. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so let's make it worse. Everything is always better when it gets worse, right? Uh, but, but let's extend this into another kind of idea. So then the next idea of buffer overflows is called redirection. And redirection is probably the more powerful of all these buffer overflows. These earlier stack heap kind of things, we're really just talking about mischief, and it can lead to interesting things, but it often doesn't, especially today. But when we start getting into the idea of redirection, code in memory is executed the same way. And all of it sort of ties back to what I talked about last time, which was linked lists. And linked lists are ways to get from one memory block to the next memory block to the next memory block to the next memory block because things won't always fit in a single block. And so if I create a linked list, <clears throat> a vector or whatever, I actually have in my linked list, and I put again, I put all this as show notes if you want to look at it more and you can read about it uh, online just by searching for these terms. But a linked list basically says take block one. So if that's an unsigned int, that's 32 bits and link it to the next 32 bits, and the next 32 bits, and the next 32 bits. And by doing that, I can actually follow that path all the way through that linked list of things. And it could be, it could be a list of addresses, it could be a list of people, it could be whatever, but that's, that's okay. What if I can get into your linked list, and then all of a sudden you've got a massive problem? So this is one of the biggest things in buffer overflow and stack redirects is the ability of me to take my program and instead of my last pointer pointing to the end, what if my last pointer points to the beginning of your list? I can actually usurp your list and I could dump everything in it. What if that list is like medical records? Well, guess mm -hmm. what? Databases are based on linked lists. And all of a sudden, if you don't have any constraints, and I know I'm oversimplifying it. I know modern stuff has got all these, you know, security safeguards and shells around it. But this was how it originally got started. I could suddenly read out that list as well. So I run my list. My list just connects to your list and it keeps going. Okay. So that's, that's, that's the linked list extension. But. Now let's talk about instructions. So now we're really starting to edge away from the buffering. It's still buffer, but into the stack. What if you have a list of instructions on the stack? These are commands that the system is going to do. What if I can figure out where the last instruction in your list is, and I can attach a pointer to that list and make it point to my list? Ooh. So now when Russ is running his drone and he hits up or, or climb or whatever the instruction is, if at the end of that climb instruction I attach to my linked list, I literally could inject new instructions into that command. I can really add to what's going on. And, and this is a way that people attach malware to running code. So they will find a piece of code that they know about in memory and they will cause that last instruction to attach. And you can do this a lot of different ways. So one of the ways is just, I call it extrusions. So when they extrude something, it means I take the last cell of my thing 
and I make it too big. So now it should be this big and it's this big. So instead of 32 bits, it's 38 bits or whatever. It's actually, it's more defined than that. It would be like, instead of 32 bits, it's 64 bits. So I just overwrote a piece of your code. Your code setting in memory in that 32-bit buffer, my program usurps that 32-bit buffer and injects something else there. So I just lay it on top of it. And all of a sudden, when your code gets to that box, instead of doing what you thought it was going to do, it goes off and does something else entirely, or it executes the instruction I injected by overlaying on your list of stacked instructions. Yikes. You ever see anything like that? I mean, not, not specifically, <laughs> but again, all theoretical. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, but these are things that are not that difficult really to do right. because all this stuff is stored somewhere in memory. It's stored somewhere on the mm -hmm. stack. Every command that's executed, whether you're playing a video game or you're flying a drone or you're, you're using your phone to see what time it is, all that stuff is being put on the stack and each of those commands are getting executed in some kind of order. If I can somehow just drop a piece of code right across the middle of that and have it redirect off in a different path, that linked list gets corrupted and now my code gets executed. And, and if I'm really, really good, I may even have my code put it back in your code. So, I, so as an example, you are running a program that, uh, that uh, computes the temperature on your thermostat. I inject a piece of code that goes out, downloads, and installs a piece of malware on your machine. I could literally do that by injecting those stack instructions. And you say, why on earth, Doug? Why not just run the code separately? How do these stack instructions run? What kind of privilege? Any guesses? you want to guess, Russ? Uh, I guess they would need admin. Oh. Well, what if a piece of code... Or that well, have you have you ever run something as admin? You know that, that thing in Windows where you right-click on it and say run as administrator? Yep. Well, guess what administrator can do? Anything. Everything. Yeah. On Linux and, and Apple, it's root. So if you're root and you're running applications as root and they have corruption in them, that corruption gets run as root as well, which means I can go in and install malware. I can go in and take over other parts of the stack. I can do who knows what. And all of a sudden all that redirection of those variable types becomes a kind of buffer overflow, kind of stack overflow problem. And when that happens to you, guess what? All of a sudden, I own you. And I can inject all kinds of code I could take over your system. So for instance, one thing that I've seen that's a sort of classic uh, stack overflow problem was just laying over the username and password. So just by overwriting that, the username and password became part of my instruction set. And I could then just extract it, and I know what the admin login is, and that was an old uh, an old compromise. Uh, there are tons of these kind of things today. Um, even if it's just dumping the entire contents of memory, and this was back. I asked Russ if he'd done memory forensics. Memory forensics was a kind of uh, of doing this by just literally going in while the system was running and pointing at the beginning, and then just dumping everything in memory into a file, and you could take that file out later and then go out and sit down and look at it and see what was there. In old Windows systems, guess what was in memory unencrypted? Do you know? I don't. The username and password. It was oh, sitting, it was sitting right in memory. Tech. And there used to be whole toolkits you could download for, just for Windows to dump memory. And in fact, they automated it so that you could just literally reach out and grab whatever, and you could see that string just sitting there in, uh, in memory. Today, so just to, to finish up on this, today most operating systems stop these kind of things, or at least they try to. Most compilers stop this kind of thing, or at least they try to, but sometimes you can't. Uh, if you want to have low-level coding languages like C, you often, it's, you have to allow people to block things, but they don't necessarily have to enforce it because they want to leave it open to the designer developer to, to write their code the way they want to write it. And that becomes a bit of a problem if you write your code poorly. And guess what? People do. Because not everybody thinks about security when they write code. Which, of course, leads us to maybe a future show to talk about secure coding techniques. Because um, that's something I, I keep hearing a lot about. Uh, and especially as we start designing systems that are going to maybe be plugged into our brains and things like that. Because the last thing you want to do is have a buffer overflow done on your brain. you have anything else, Russ? Um, no, I, I think that this is really important, um, you know, especially as, as we continue on with, with IoT and and things of like that. I mean, I definitely could include this in my IoT class.
just because you know it's it's super super important, super relevant. What's going on today? I, I, as a side note, I was reading yesterday. I wasn't able to look at the exercise software. I was reading too much about jackpotting ATMs, uh, which I think is kind of interesting. So that's how know, I got but... a new car. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and I, I want to do a show about jackpotting ATMs because, uh, again, that's a pretty important thing that's going on. And, and, and the reason that we covered some of this kind of boring computer science-y stuff was I really wanted you guys to, to have a basic understanding of this because we want to talk about this more. And as we talk about jackpotting, we talk about Spectre and Meltdown and AMD compromises, which I want to talk about next show. And then we want to talk about jackpotting. All this becomes the kind of basis for all those conversations. So uh, show notes have a whole bunch of examples. Uh, there's tons of stuff on the internet about buffer overflows and stack overflow, everything from basic to crazy. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of extremely esoteric stuff. All of it's really super fun. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of thing, it's a starting point for almost every kind of hacking that ever was. So when, when you see or you're, you're thinking in your head, I want to learn how to hack. Don't ever post that anywhere, please. Um, but when you are thinking those things, this is a starting point because this is where most hackers start thinking about how to compromise just really, not just script kitty crap, but when people really start thinking about how do I compromise something, this was where a lot of people started by sitting down, looking at how code works, looking at how code accesses memory, and looking at how privilege is enforced inside of a system. And if you want to jackpot an ATM, you shouldn't do that. It's illegal and you'll go to jail. But if you are thinking about things like that, all those things start with this computer science-y stuff. So you kind of have to sit down and think about it a little bit and maybe up your coding skills a bit so that you can start playing around. Next time, we will talk about Spectre and Meltdown. I promise, unless something really exciting happens in the meantime. Uh, but that's about it from here in Blizzard country. So hang in there, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Russ. Bye. Bye. Thank you.